I want to spend a minute talking about clients and servers. All right. So you've worked on your website locally, that is on your machine. All right. And you've got it working and you're ready for it to go live. Well, first of all, there's all sorts of testing strategies you should take and testing strategies even once it goes live and all that. But let's assume everything goes okay and you're ready to put it up. What do you need to make a website go live? You have the best idea. You need a server, a web server. And what does a web server do? R right. Uh, <laughs> it serves web, right. But we might want to clarify that a little bit. A web server is a computer with software that is able to respond to certain kinds of requests. Any kind of server is a machine with software that responds to certain kinds of requests. Um, a lot of times people talk about the server in an organization. Yeah. In, rea in, re in reality, though, um, any machine can be a client and a server. It depends on a transaction. Uh, you could, for example, have a web server talking to a database server. And in that case, the web server is a client of the database server. All right? We're interested right now exclusively in web servers, though. So web servers are machines with software that can listen for and respond to requests made from various clients. Um, what are the most popular web server software available? What, what are some examples of web server software? Uh, Apache? Apache? Apple has one on the App Store for 20 bucks. Okay. Apple has one on the App Store for 20 bucks. I wonder if anyone has ever used it, considering you can run Apache uh, on, on that. It might not be quite as straightforward, but theirs might even be based on Apache for all I know. And what's, what's, another, what's another web serving software? IIS. IIS. Microsoft's, I'm trying to think what the letters stand for. Internet Information Systems? Something like that. It's, it's IIS. Essentially, Microsoft's IIS works on Microsoft machines. Apache works on everything. All right, so you can run it on Windows, you can run it on Linux, you can run it on Apple. And Apache is an open source. Uh, web server, which means that the source code is available. Anyone can make customizations to it, and anyone can add features to it. And then there's a group of people who are responsible for coordinating everything into um, each subsequent release. So, how do you get your code? So, so you have the web server, and it could be a web server you set up, or you could contract with a web hosting company. All right. Usually, for many, many, many organizations, you know, it's not worth the hassle to get your own server. Maybe a bit larger corporation, but for smaller companies, you know, hey, you're just gonna you're just gonna get server space somewhere else and let them deal with all the security issues and so on and so forth. Um, how do you get your code up to the server from your machine? You upload it. How do you do that? What, what are the kinds of programs that you can use to do that? FTP is one. FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. Um, many uh, many um, web hosting companies come with um, um, software with a browser interface that allows you to do that. Um, cPanel is a very popular one, and there's some other panels as well. And essentially it does the FTP job maybe in a slightly different way, but it gives you a neat little GUI interface and so on. So you have your local machine. You then use the FTP program to send it to um, your web hosting. Um, how do you get a web address? In other words, you register a domain. And who do you do that with? Yeah, uh, you can actually purchase a domain from a lot of different people. But, yeah, it all goes through. And I, is that ICANN? Yeah, uh, which is the organization that coordinates it so that there are two Google.coms. 
right? I mean, that, that wouldn't be very good if half the world went to one Google and the other half went to another Google.com. Um, DNSs, someone said something about DNS, I think, domain name servers. Um, when you register and when you put stuff up, initially, if you create a website, it might take a while because there's actually a bunch of servers that like are sort of like the web's phone book that says this address translates to this IP address. And therefore, it actually takes a little bit of time for that information to travel around the world and hit all those servers. So it would be conceivable that you could pull up www.mywebsite.com and someone else living somewhere else might not be able to. All right, because there is sometimes a, a, a little bit of time. I don't think I've ever seen it like go longer than a day or so, and that was a while ago. As with everything, it's probably getting faster and more efficient these days. All right, so you register a domain, you have a host, and that typically will involve looking for uh, in, in, you know, uh, subscribing to a web hosting company as opposed to having one of your own. Larger organization, you might have one of your own. Use an FTP program or some other software to load your pages up on the server, and then your server is able to respond to requests for it. That's what the web server software allows your server to do. In the most simple case, yeah, I should have wrote in our webs. In the simplest case, the server listening and responding to the request is simply finding the files and delivering them to the client that requested it. All right, that is the simplest case. Um, the server, again, has software that's able to listen to requests. The client makes a request either by typing in the address bar, uh, the website that you want or the web page that you want, or pulling down and clicking on a bookmark or clicking on a link from Google or whatever. All those things generate a request. And if you look in your browser wi uh, window in the address bar, HTTP, that's the kind of request, hypertext transfer protocol. Web servers have the software to handle those sorts of requests. And then you have the URL uh, of that. And the URL con corresponds to pages and directories on the server. So, Again, you can send pages to particular directories, or you can put pages in particular directories, and the request can ask, ask for pages out of those directories. That request gets routed based on the URL name and the DNS servers out there on the internet, gets routed to the proper web server. And the web server, in the simplest case of just plain old HTML files, is going to retrieve the files and they get sent back to the client, and the client views the web page. That's how the earliest days of the web worked. I mean, since day one of the web, that's how it worked. You had static HTML files. Would request them, they would get sent over. Things got more complicated. You could put CSS in, you could put images in, you could put other files in. But with static web pages, static meaning not changing, with static web pages, that's sort of the formula. However, both these things are computers. All right? Both the client and the server are computers. Or, you know, I guess we could extend that to say you could be mobile devices or could be a gaming console or it could be something like that. But the bottom line is these clients have some processing power at their end, typically. All right? And the server has processing power at the end. So simply grabbing files and sending them is kind of not taking advantage, really, of the power of the computers. It's, it's really... You know, this is the server's just serving the role of, uh, you know, a delivery agent. It finds files you want and it sends it to you. So, to allow for dynamic pages, that is pages that can respond to your location 
or can respond to data in a database or can respond to items that you've entered on a form, we have dynamic pages which are typically done via server-side scripting. Now when the request comes in, there's some additional information that goes with it. I mean that information was always there, but now the server's going to do something with it. And that includes things such as who the IP address is, all right, what the IP address is, maybe some information that was entered on the form, and so on. The server then can take that, use the dynamic scripts, which are little programs, possibly access a database, and use that to piece together a custom page just for that request. And again, good example of that is Angel. You come on, you log in, you type in your username and password, that gets sent to the Angel server via the form. The server takes your information, makes sure that you're a valid user, looks at the database, see what classes you're enrolled in, and it creates an Angel homepage just for you. So no one's going to have an identical Angel homepage to you. All right? Now, here's the thing. Keep in mind again. Clients understand HTML as well as CSS and JavaScript and maybe a few other things. So these scripts that are written in things such as PHP or ASP.NET slash C Sharp or Java or any number of things, the server's job is to take that code and output HTML. So regardless of whether you have static pages or dynamic pages, the user gets HTML. Now, then, therefore, you know, we're starting to take advantage of the server's horsepower, right? The server can do more than just deliver files. It can actually make files. It can actually make web pages given the parameters that it's given. This is also a machine, all right? And simply displaying information in a browser, I mean, back when I was a little kid and you had microfilm in the library, those devices could display something on a screen, right? That's no great feat to be able to do that. However, A, that probably wasn't a very good analogy. B, that makes me sound like 200 years old, all right? So... Uh, I should edit that out, but eh, never mind. It was discovered to take advantage of the fact that this is a computer to do some little tasks. All right? We don't want it to do major tasks because a class machine, we would, even if we could, interact directly with the database. We would want control over that sort of transaction. So we would want that to go through a web server. We don't really know what kind of software the client has. We don't know what kind of system they have. All we know is that they have a browser that typically understands HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. All right. So what we can do is we can send to the client, in addition to the HTML, CSS, we can send some JavaScript. And that JavaScript allows the client to do some manipulation of the page without having to go through and request it again from the server. All right? So there's a couple advantages to that. One is because the client has a JavaScript locally, the response is immediate. All right? Because it doesn't have to go all the internet to the server. Maybe wait turn on the server and then come back. Now with faster internet connections, that's still going to be sort of quick, but it's not going to be as quick as a piece of code that's running right here on this machine. The other advantage is it doesn't bother server the server with little requests that 
the client can handle. The analogy I give, getting back to a food analogy, is if you go into a restaurant and you order something and the, the waiter brings you, you know, ketchup, mustard, salt, pepper, and leaves it on your table, all right? It's a win for everyone, right? Because if you want more salt on your fries, you can just go and put it on there. You don't have to wait to flag the waiter down, have the waiter bring the salt over, shake a little bit of salt on your fries, and then go back to, you know, back to the kitchen, all right? So it's a win-win situation. The waiter certainly is happy not to have to go and salt everyone's fries for them. All right? And you are certainly happy because you don't want to wait, you know, two minutes while the waiter comes over to, to squirt some ketchup on your, on your fries. So it's a win-win situation. All right? Now notice that we're not giving the client the keys back to the kitchen so they can make, you know, all you can eat caviar and filet mignon, right? There's some things that are the important things, the resource intensive things. But those little sorts of operations, we can let the client do and everyone's going to be happier. Well, what's the, what's the equivalent of those little things in the web world, in JavaScript? Let's look at an example. If I go up to a page here, and here's my page. Notice as I put my mouse over certain sections of the page, that happens, the page changes a little bit. Now if you're, if you have a sharp eye, you notice a couple things. It's not going back to the server. How do I know it's not going back to the server? Because, boom, notice that when I click refresh, when I do request the page again from the server, there's a little, little flicker where it's redrawing the page. Okay? When I do this, there's no flicker. So it's not redrawing the entire page again. So it hasn't requested a page from the server. It is simply is doing something else. All right. The other thing is if we follow the status bar, when I click on a link to go somewhere else, you see little messages down here saying waiting for page, loading the page, and so on and so forth. So we can come to the conclusion that this is not going back to the server to redisplay this menu. There we go. I was on the wrong row. That instead something else is going on. And what else is going on is going on on the client side. And that is client side JavaScript. All right? While there are many alternatives on the server side for the scripting language, at its root, the, the client side language is JavaScript. Now, to be sure, there are JavaScript frameworks that can extend that, such as jQuery. But jQuery is simply built on top of JavaScript. All right, so it's not like jQuery is a different language. jQuery is more or less an add-on to JavaScript. All right, so what happens then in this case? We request ESPN's home page. It goes there. If we were logged in, if I had an account on ESPN, maybe I could pick my favorite teams or put my area so it could show local results. Maybe it would show local results. It even says that. It's smart enough, like if I logged on, it would show my favorites here. It's smart enough to know that I'm probably in the northern Ohio area, and it can recommend the Browns, the Cavs, the Indians, Ohio State, right? If someone in some place else were to view this page, they get different recommendations. How does the server do that? Well, based on your IP address, it knows approximately where you are, and it can take a guess that, well, people in 
Loring County area tend to be Browns, Indians, Cavs, Ohio State fans. All right. So that's an example of server-side code in action. Server-side code is used to prepare custom web pages for people. Client-side code is used to change those pages after they've loaded. So, what happens when I make this request? It goes in, it forms the HTML page, it looks to see where I am, and it customizes my suggested favorites and so on. It delivers an HTML document to the client. Now, what does the HTML document contain? And I say HTML document, I mean the whole package, all those files. Bunch of stuff. It contains the HTML code. What is the HTML code? The HTML is the content. Content, not context. It is the text. It is the images. And so on. It contains the CSS. And what is that? That deals with the appearance. The layout. The formatting. Finally, it delivers JavaScript. And what does JavaScript provide? JavaScript provides the interactivity on the page. We could probably get into some other things that JavaScript can do, but primarily, especially in this case, is providing the interactivity. And what do I mean by interactivity? I mean the user does something, the page responds. And the page responds without going to the server. So it's not like I'm clicking a link and getting a brand new web page. It's that the page itself, there's code in there that says, if the user does this, the page is going to change. What about the page is going to change? The HTML and the CSS. So I change the HTML and CSS, I get a new page. So, when I initially load this page, guess what? All those menus are loaded as part of this page. So the content has already been loaded for NFL menu, NBA menu, MLB menu, NCAA football menu, and so on down the line. Well, if it's been loaded, why can't we see it? Because it's hidden. How does it get hidden? <laughs> Pardon me? Well... Yeah, it, it, it's through, it gets hidden through CSS. How do we change it from being hidden to being visible? That's through JavaScript. All right, that's the interactivity. So in other words, if we were to do a view source, we could actually find this stuff on the page. Yeah, let's do it for the heck of it. All right, here's some navigation. It's a nav ID. I think I'm just, I think I'm going through them again. Yeah. But the idea is, is however they do it, it gets sent, the code for that gets sent to the browser. All right? You actually could do this a bunch of different ways, but it gets sent to the browser. Well, where does JavaScript come in? JavaScript says when the user does something, the page changes. So when the user puts their mouse over MLB, the MLB submenu changes. When the user puts the mouse over NBA, that changes. And so on down the line. Now again, I didn't spend a lot of time reverse engineering this, so I can't tell you exactly how this works. It's possible they're using Ajax, which is a different way of, of the client and server interacting. But 
For our purposes, there is JavaScript involved in the sense that without reloading the entire page, I put my mouse over something and the page changes. All right. Well, well, HTML5, the question is, does HTML get rid of a lot of JavaScript? HTML5 does get rid of some things. For one thing, HTML5 allows you to do animation that you used to have to use Flash for. So that's true. Um, HTML5 does get rid of some JavaScript potentially, like we looked at with the form controls. In the old days, you had to validate a form using JavaScript. All right. Now there are um, different input types where I could define it as a date and I can only enter a date into that field. Now the problem with that is remember not all browsers support that and so you would probably need to still have to do that. Um, in addition, CSS3 would get rid of JavaScript for some mouse over effects. That's why I'm saying that it's possible this could be done via CSS. But this example, I, I mean, the concepts in this example hold regardless of the techno specific technology. So to answer your question, yeah, that's kind of true, but it doesn't get rid of all of it. All right. So the bottom line is we have three technologies that we're going to use here on our web page, two of which we've already covered, and one we're going to spend the last couple weeks of class covering. We have HTML which is the content. CSS, which is the appearance and layout. And finally, JavaScript, which is the interactivity. In a nutshell, JavaScript achieves its interactivity by manipulating those other two. Those other two. All right, that's how it achieves the interactivity, by manipulating, by changing those other things. So each technology has its responsibility. And you're best off if you don't mix those. All right, just like we said, you know, don't put things in HTML that deal with the appearance. All right, that belongs to CSS. And by doing it that way, you make a more flexible site, more flexible code. JavaScript does the, the, the interactivity. That is, JavaScript is able to change, based on users' actions, different properties of the HTML and the CSS of a page. All right? Let's do a, a for instance here. And this for instance that we're going to do, this first example we're going to do, is going to illustrate, even though it's going to illustrate it very simply, is going to illustrate sort of the recipe for much of the JavaScript that we're going to encounter, or that you're going to encounter. And that recipe is a user event starts the ball rolling. All right? In other words, in this case, the user event is the user putting their mouse over a particular item on the screen. That's a user event. Not all, but much JavaScript is invoked based on that. JavaScript could also be invoked based on a button being pressed. All right? And so on. So the user event. The second part is the DOM. DOM stands for Document Object Model. In other words, the DOM is the way that JavaScript points to the things on the page that it wants to change. All right? And finally, there's the actual JavaScript code
spend tax. This one's a piece of cake. I mean, in five minutes, I could probably tell you everything I know about user events. All right. The DOM and JavaScript are conceptually simple, I guess, but there's a lot of detail to it, and it can be very tricky, especially the DOM. The DOM is the one area that can be tricky. The JavaScript code itself, a lot of that depends on how much programming experience you have. If you've done programming in other languages, then things such as if statements and loops and all that should come pretty easy for you. One thing that's nice is um, if, you've, if you've taken programming like C Sharp, C Sharp follows the same sort of syntax as JavaScript does. And really, the one thing you'd really have to focus on then is the document object model. All right. Let's create a little page that's going to use JavaScript to, dy to, to be dynamic, to make the page change, to make it interactive. All right? And we're going to do it um, to, 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 to show a spoiler on a page. All right? So, there's a, so we don't just sh come out and show the spoiler. We give the user a chance to see the spoiler. All right? And what, 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 what spoiler should we use? I'm thinking that Darth, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, so Darth, Darth Vader dies? Hey. I was going to say that Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's dad. What? <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know. All right, so we're going to make our page looks like, look like this. The Game of Thrones spoiler, everyone dies. Yeah. Yeah. So my Star Wars page is going to have a paragraph about Star Wars, and then it's going to have a button that says Show Spoiler. And then when I click on the spoiler, the spoiler is going to appear. So this is the HTML. All right, let's think of the HTML we want. For this, probably like an H1. For this, yeah, article maybe with a paragraph. For this. This will be a button, and not a submit button, but a button button, all right? Because we don't want to submit to a server. All this is going to happen on the client side, so we're not sending it to the server. So it's just going to be a plain old button. And this could be a paragraph, all right? So let's go in, and let's make this, and let's do the HTML first. What I like about this example is that it shows how all three technologies interact. In other words, how are we going to make the spoiler invisible via CSS? The content's going to be there, it's just that we're not going to show it. Okay, so we'll go in here. And I will put in... All right, here's our basic HTML code. I'll put an article here. As soon as I put the start tag, I'm going to put the end tag so I remember to do it. I'll, I'm going to put my first paragraph tag that says Star Wars is about and I'm going to type the whole paragraph. Uh, 
I'm going to put my input type equals button You, you got me confused. You're talking about Leia. I type Darth is Luke is his daughter. Yeah. <laughs> got me all confused. That would really be a spoiler, wouldn't it? Whoa. Yeah, whoa. Okay, so here is the HTML. You know, note to self, pick something else next semester. So... <laughs> All right, so we're going to go save this. And right now I just have the HTML. So if I go and view this, we see the spoiler. All right. How can we make the spoiler hidden? <laughs> How can we make the spoiler hidden? Well, first of all, what technology are we going to use? CSS, right? Because this isn't content, this is the appearance of the content. And not appearing is a form of appearance, all right? Whoa. Yeah, I say it sounds, sounds like this should be a philosophy class here. Style. So how do I make that invisible? Pardon me? Yeah, I probably am going to need to give the one I want to hide an ID because I don't want to make all the paragraphs disappear. I just want to make one of them disappear. So I'll say ID equals... Spoiler. And I'm going to give it an ID of spoiler 1 just in case I did extended this and had a second spoiler and a third spoiler. Because remember, an ID has to be unique. So if I had another spoiler down there, it, it would need to have an ID different than spoiler. So, you can actually make it hidden two ways. I can say um, visibility hidden. Or I can say display none. What's the difference between the two? If I say visibility hidden, it's there, you just can't see it, which means it takes up that much space. It takes up the real estate. If I say display none, it will, yeah, it, it will not be there and it will not take up any space. So typically, you know, you would use display none, unless you wanted a blank space there for Taylor Swift to write your name. Uh, I can't, but the third time of the semester with this, yeah, I, I'm, I'm done. All right. Oh, I get it. Oh, All right, so now I go and... What? Did I forget to save it? ID equals spoiler, spoiler one. Oh. All right. So now we have that. So now we have the HTML and the CSS working together. The HTML shows, or the HTML content has it. All right. The CSS makes sure we don't see it, though. Now, if we do a view source, we could actually see it. Oh, man, that gives it away. Oh. But anyone, anyone that doesn't know that spoiler probably doesn't know how to view source. All right? Because anyone that's worked with computers has seen Star Wars 100 times. All right? So, okay. So now we have to make, now we have to make, pardon me? Not a media query. Yeah. Now what we have to do is we have to follow our JavaScript recipe. We need a user event. So, 
What user event do we want to write code for? The click of the button. All right. All the user events start with on click. Uh, I'm sorry, start with the word on. So in this case, on click. There's on click, there's mouse over, there's mouse out. So when you mouse on something, you can have something happen. When you get your mouse away from something, you can have something happen. There's on key down, on key up. On key press, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Quick Google will show you a list of the events. Here's a list of common ones, and there's probably even a few beyond that. So, I'm going to say on the button, one mistake that some students make is they would think, well, this is the thing I want to make appear, so I'll put the on click on that. No, you put it on the thing that the user is going to interact with. So, the user is interacting with the button. The user is clicking the button. So, I'm going to say on click equals, I'm going to put in double quotes. I'm going to put my JavaScript statement. And my JavaScript statement is going to be very simple. It's going to be a one-liner. The important piece of this is going to be that I'm going to use the DOM. And what does the DOM do? The DOM points to the thing on the page I want to change. So what do I want to point to on the page? I want to point to the thing that has an ID of spoiler1. So we're going to use one of the workhouse, workhorse um, functions of the DOM, and that is get element by ID. So I'm going to say document get element by ID. Then in parentheses, I put the value of the ID. What do I want to change about it? I want to change its style. What about the style do I want to change? I will change the display. And what do I want to change that to? Block. So, let's look at this. Let's look at this by itself. This little Let's look at the on-click event by itself. I'm going to make the, well, it all fits. On-click is the event. Document get element by ID spoiler is pointing to this element of the page. Document means somewhere on this page. All right? Look on this page. You could actually write JavaScript if you popped open a second window. You could write JavaScript to manipulate that second window. So you have to say what you want to manipulate. Document means this page is what we're worried about. Get element by ID means find on the page the thing that has this ID. We then use what's called dot notation to zero in on the specific thing that we want to change. Because I could want to change a lot of things about this, right? I mean, maybe not in this example, but in other examples, I could change any number of different things. Here, what is I want to change? It's something with the style of it. What do I want to change? I want to change the display. Notice that this, the fact that this is display, matches that. Equals and then I put in the new value that I want it to have. And that is block. Because if I wanted to display it, I would say display block up here. Now, a couple things I want you to notice, and we'll build on this next time. Number one, the case matters. This is case sensitive. So if I put in a capital G here for get element by ID, it's not going to work. The other thing to note is the two different kinds of quotation marks I use. I use the double quotes to indicate the beginning and the end of my JavaScript statement. 
within the double quotes, where I need quotes, I use the single quotes. If I were to use the double quotes here, the browser is going to think that the JavaScript statement would end there and it would blow up. All right? So, HTML, CSS, JavaScript all have their role. HTML is the content, including the stuff we don't want to see at first. CSS hides the stuff we don't want to see at first. JavaScript dynamically, interactively changes the stuff so that we do see it. How do we see it? User event on click, trigger something. We use the DOM to point to the thing that we want to change, and we write a JavaScript statement to do that. So, if everything works, then one thing that you get is, is IE is afraid that you might be encountering some sort of virus or something, so you have to give permission for it if you run it through IE. Click display spoiler and there it is. Now, we can do a lot more involved things with this, but the, the, the basics of it are the same. User event starts the ball rolling. We use the DOM to point to the things on the page that we want to do something to. We write JavaScript statements to do the stuff that we want to do. All right? Okay, I'm going to upload this. Next week, we'll expand on these examples, and uh, we'll see you up in lab.